Nigeria's first ladies against cancer flock have issued a statement in support of the global strategy to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer as a public health problem. The first ladies call for bold action to ensure that the strategy's 90-70-90 targets are achieved for women and girls throughout the country. But the statement declares, quote, we stand ready to work in partnership with other national stakeholders to ensure that these global commitments are taken forward in Nigeria. As a group of women leaders, we call for early steps in Nigeria to send a strong signal of the importance of cervical health for women, our communities, and our economies despite the COVID-19 pandemic." End quote. Our Excellency Dr. Zainab Shinkafi Baguru is a pediatric consultant, uh, interestingly, a loud voice in the fight against cancer and a child's right advocate. She is the first lady of Kirby State, a platform that has turned her into a role model in the state and beyond. Her advocacy for women, children and the youth in Kirby State and northern Nigeria as a whole cuts across health, education and skills acquisition. And she joins us live on the show now to discuss accelerating the elimination of cervical cancer as a public health problem in Nigeria. Glad to have you join us, uh, First Lady, Dr. Zenaf Shinkafi uh, Bagudu. All right, let's start, good, let's start it this way. Uh, how serious, indeed, a, a challenge or a public health problem is cervical cancer amongst women in Nigeria? How prevalent is it? And what provoked the forming of the organization First Ladies Against Cancer Flock? Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Cervical cancer is the second most common cancer in Nigerian women and the world. Uh, we have about 10,000 women getting the disease, about 14,000 get it every year, and at least 10,000 die from it. It's so that tells us it's a very, very serious disease. Globally, of all the women that get cervical cancer, 85% of them come from low middle income countries like Nigeria. Nigeria is the most populous black nation on earth. So you can well imagine that a good proportion of these women come from Nigeria. Um, having established that fact, we know that it's, um, it's, some, it's a cancer that we can do something about. So this is why we're really advocating to talk about it, to create awareness about it, and to prevent it, to educate our women about it. Um, yes, cancers are a very difficult group of uh, diseases, but we know that there are some of them that we can really eliminate, which is why the uh, WHO's global call to action, which happened in 2018, Nigeria was the only country that signed up to that global call to action, which is a very commendable thing, recognizing the importance of this disease and the significant proportion of Nigerian women that, are, that contribute to the global figures. The first ladies of Nigeria that are involved in the fight against cancer are about eight of us, and we deem it very important to contribute with our voices, being the chief advocates of our states, we're mothers, uh, we don't uh, make the laws, but we can influence them. We can influence the health-seeking behaviors of our people, in particular the mothers, the girls, and also the husbands, and how they influence the health-seeking behaviors of the women and enable them to access better health care. We can also advocate at higher levels for the policymakers to include uh, facilities in the health budget, to include vaccinations, and to help us um, improve the ways that women can access this health care. Um, I can talk a bit more about them. I'm sure that you're going to ask me those kind of questions. Certainly, Dr. Shankavi Bagudu, and um, thank you for the work that you and the First Ladies Against Cancer are doing. I mean, it's amazing that Nigeria has signed up to this, and like you said, we have a lot of questions to ask you. In the statement that was issued, uh, you pointed out that cervical cancer reflects global inequity. Can you elaborate on this for us? You also touched uh, just now on the vaccination as well for cervical cancer. It's something we don't have here in Nigeria, just readily accessible to women, the HPV vaccine. What efforts are being made in that regard to make it a readily accessible vaccine? HPV, that is human papillomavirus, is the common 
is the cause of can cervical cancer. That is why we say it is, an, it is a cancer that can be eliminated. Just like you mentioned in the beginning, the global call to act a uh, strategy for eliminating it is 90-17-90. 90% vaccination of girls for, we want to make sure that we vaccinate 90% of girls before that are age 15. We want to make sure that we screen 70% of our women, and we want to aim to treat 90% of women that come down with cervical cancer through global partnerships with funding partners such as Gavi, the WHO, and other major multinationals and uh, like the W, uh, like the World Bank. And that brings me to the issue of um, inequity. Inequity because it is a vaccine that has existed since the year 2006. It is a vaccine that is available. It might not be available in enough quantity, but it is available. However, 84 million African girls do not have access to this vaccine simply because of the cost. It's not available. It initially was quite expensive, but we have seen it drop from about $100 to about $12. In the high-income countries, the girls before the age of 15 receive it as a matter of routine. Nowadays, even boys in the UK receive uh, HPV vaccine. However, girls in low-middle-income countries, most of low-middle-income countries, including a country like Nigeria, which if we do not uh, sort out a country as big as Nigeria with 200 million, we're not going to be able to say we're eliminating cervical cancer in the world. We've just celebrated the end of polio, and the world could not celebrate the end of polio without addressing it in Nigeria. The minute Nigeria was declared polio free, then we were able to celebrate it more nationally, so no more globally. So we have to talk about it, Nigeria, when it comes to cancer as well. So in, when we talk about global inequalities, we're talking about the inequalities that exist amongst our women being unable, our girls being unable to receive this vaccination that is available in the world. Yes, we have been told that it's going to be available by the first quarter of um, January 2021. We hope and pray that the government is going to be able to afford it because of obviously of all the health care needs that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought up. And this is another reason why the First Ladies Against Cancer is really working hard to ensure that the global elimination strategy declared, which Nigeria signed up to in 2018, and which the strategy has just been adopted uh, barely two weeks ago globally by all the member nations of the World Health Assembly, is not left at the back burner. And that's why we're calling for the adoption to be effected as planned. All right. Uh, I'm going to bring you back to uh, uh, the V, what I call, I just now call the VST, which is vaccinate, uh, screen, and treat. I'm going to come back to that. But let me take you up on the issue of 12 countries have this HPV vaccine that you talked about, uh, the immunization program. Why doesn't Nigeria have it? And what are you doing to make sure that Nigeria indeed has it? Oh my, this is a very emotional topic for me and I get very emotional. The countries that have it, if you look at them, they're small countries. They're like the size of states in Nigeria. And it's very easy for global funding partners to think of those countries and declare that, you know, Kenya is cervical is offering cervical cancer. If you look at the population of these countries, they're like maybe one or two states in Nigeria. It's a funding thing, and it's not possible for you know for the world and the funding partners to keep on talking about universal health care, to keep on talking about funding access and funding aid when we are not getting the aid that is going to properly affect our fund our health care needs. We get thrown peanuts that is not even scratching the top of the surface of our needs. When you talk about national budgets, and we're told that we need to put 15% of our national budget into healthcare, look at the budget. If you do a comparison of our economics, 
the economy, the budget of Nigeria at best is what, 25 billion? And you look at that of countries like um, Brazil, for instance, which is 650, and you, t you are told to take 15%. How much, even if you take the entire sum and throw it at healthcare, are you going to be able to achieve with that? It's not possible. It's like comparing Lagos State and Kebi State. The actual amount is not going to be the same. So what you get in outcome, because the the numbers are just not the same. It, the outcome will not be the same. So this is what the problem is. Those smaller countries are easier to handle piece by piece. If you come to Nigeria and say you're handling a state and a state, you have not sorted out a country. But in the other countries, they're doing it state, country by country, and they're big countries. They've ticked a country, ticked a country. Nigeria does have the political will, Nigeria does have some funding, and Nigeria can put down the funding, but we need to be able to access the vaccines. There's a long waiting list globally, and we are not allowed to get onto that waiting list until we meet certain criteria, which I believe we have, and that is why we're now talking about um, uh, the first quarter of 2021. Huh? But we need to keep up the pressure with people like myself, with people like yourself, so that the funding partners, Gabi overshot its funding budget this year with a lot of funding from even partners from Nigeria. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be on that list. There's no reason why Nigeria shouldn't be one of the 12 countries or 13 countries, 14 countries in Africa that is offering the vaccine. I mean, you're absolutely right, and it's such a shame, Doctor, because you you actually made me think of something, and you're right. When I was 15 years old in the UK, an HPV vaccine was immediately issued to every single girl in my class, and it was the norm. And Nigeria should be there and should be receiving these vaccines, and that's why it's good to have groups like yours that are advocating for this. And that leads me to ask, because you're calling on the government to set up a technical working committee in order for us to reach these goals. What would be the short and medium-term uh, goals for that technical committee that you're trying to achieve, if you can elaborate on that? You know, we, we have to write technical working committee, but I'll say this boldly on air, these committees don't really work. Facts. If we're going to set up a committee, then we need to set up a committee with the right people, the people that have the passion. It's not about a committee with the minister or the commissioner and that, that doesn't have time and is doing COVID and is doing 10 million other things. Let it be a committee made up of people that are interested and are passionate about doing this. There is a committee, there is a cervical cancer working group that is working towards starting it. If you ask the Minister of Health, this is the question, answer he's going to give you, that yes, there is a committee, but what has it done in the last two years? What has it done since it was set up? Are we sure that we're going to see this vaccine in January? There's a National Primary Health Care Agency. Are we going to see the vaccine in January? I need to know. The Vice President talked about this at the launch of the IMO program, but, you know, we've been hearing this for so long, and the vaccine has been in existence since 2006, and Nigerian girls are not receiving it. It's time to put an end to that, honestly. It's really time to put an end to it. The, the committee has to be, it's the primary healthcare agency's responsibility to vaccinate people, babies, girls, adults, everybody. It is their primary responsibility. We need to provide the vaccines, we need to screen, we need to educate people, collaborate with the non-governmental organizations, civil society, uh, to educate people generally, not just the women, but the men as well, because of our culture, because of our society, that will allow everybody to access these um, services, provide the services, provide the learning environment, teach our girls about it, allow them to do it. We run a pilot program in Kebi, uh, uh, early, at late last year till early this year. We had a partner, Jai's Foundation, that gave us some funding for it. We were ready to vaccinate 300 girls, but we only got permission for 100 at the end of the day. Why? Oh. Because of the cultural beliefs and so on and so forth, long story. At the end of the day, for that particular round, we were only able to do 100. But I assure you, when we go back, we will be able to do 500. Because Good. they have seen the effects and we have educated them and so many things have happened. And this is how uh, health education and improves generally over time. And this is what we should do. 
I'm not one of those that says that, oh, government should do this and government should do that. It has to be a collective effort and we can do it. All right, Doctor, you've mentioned two challenges that I, I, I picked up. One, you were to 200, you did 300. That's a huge challenge, even though you're positive about the next time it's going to get to 500. But you are not quite positive with the issue of committees. And when I listened to you, it sounded to me like what you're really saying is not that the committees don't work, but that the right people are not put, like putting square pegs in round holes, which is wrong. So what are you doing really about those challenges? I don't know what I asked you. How can you prevent cervical cancer? How can we prevent cervical cancer? Yeah. This is what we're talking about. I mean, you, you talked about early steps, you know, and I want to ask... Yeah, early steps. And I'm, I'm, I want to ask, what do you mean? And the question of the challenges you posed, the question of you wanted to do 100, you did 300, uh, sorry, you wanted to do 300, you did 100, but then you were positive, you were going to do 500, but then the question of committees, you weren't quite positive. And it sounded to me like it was a problem of putting square pegs in round yeah. holes. So how are you dealing with the challenges? How are you going to overcome it? And then the question of prevention. Okay. Um, with, regarding the 300 to 100 number, it's, again, it's maybe, I'll take it together with prevention. It's about education. It's about um, awareness. It's about really connecting with your people in the grassroots and making them know. Sometimes, no matter, and also realizing that experience is often the best teacher. No matter how much you t talk, the practical evidence always shows you better. I might not be able to show them in my lifetime that your daughter is not going to develop cervical cancer, but I can show them that your daughter has had a better experience. When we went and talked to the 300 girls and tried to educate them, I also learned from the whole experience. Maybe we were too quick. We have school health clubs but perhaps they were not as detailed as they should have been. And as soon as we got the funding support, we just had this program where we went to the education authorities, we went to the Emir of Yawuri, who asked us different questions. He grilled us, he's a microbiologist, and he did very well. But perhaps the Emir should have called, aside from his own um, chiefs, he could have helped us reach out to the parents better. We had one or two PTA sessions so our communication with the community could have been better. And this is what happens with funding partners as well. We tend to think of funding partners as, oh, Bill and Melinda Gates and, um, you know, just the big ones only. But there are so many organizations. These, there are really lots of organizations internally that understand the terrain and really do a lot of um work and are better placed to connect with the local people that can work better. So if we had worked with the local people more, we would have been able to bring up that number. Also, they now have an experience that, hmm, these people are not so bad. They didn't come and give our girls anything nasty. They were nice. Our girls learned from them. The girls would have gone home and said, oh, these Medicaid people came and they taught us this, they taught us that. Oh, I even met the governor's wife. Like it or not, we're governor's wives and they like to see us and we come with our noise and so on. And we, they do enjoy the whole experience. And the ones that the 200 that didn't come probably felt left out. And next time they will come on board. So these are the kind of experiences that are pleasant if you have made it a pleasant one that will enable them to come on board. Also, um, working with local organizations. Okay, I talked about that already. So prevention, prevention is about creating awareness, using the right partners. There's so many things that you can do in cancer. And this cuts across all cancers. It's not just um, cervical cancer. Smoking, avoiding multiple sexual partners, particularly with cervical cancer, and in particular, the HPV vaccine, which we have been talking about, every girl must have that opportunity of having the HPV vaccine. When we finish with the girls, then we can start with the men. Um, my, my inhibition about committees and frameworks and you know just having these bogus protocols that is because they don't work. When we do it at uh, 
different levels, we just find it becomes so cumbersome and it's not practical and quick enough for you to achieve what you want to achieve. But if we can find, or and we do find other practical ways of doing it. I'll give you a good example, the COVID-19. When we started doing awareness in that is my group, we there was a lot of, you know, maybe some uptake of it and, you know, it wasn't really working. And it, it was working. There's a state task force. They do their own work. But I went on a visit to a far hard to reach area of Kepi called Ilo. Uh, you go across the water and so on. And I got there. And I found that we went on a palliative distribution, actually, on behalf of the Northern Governors' Wives. And I found that they had no idea about COVID-19. They didn't know what it was about. So I came back to the state capital, and I was really disturbed and started bugging everybody, let's do something, let's do something, and create awareness. But again, this is a whole state. And yes, uh, we're good at creating awareness. This is what I do for a living all the time. This is my life. The Medicaid Cancer Foundation exists to create awareness on cancer. And we've been doing this for 12 years. It's not just about my husband uh, being a governor. So we worked hard on it. And I decided that one, one lesson I have learned, if anything, is that partnerships work. I'm not talking about importer, uh, international partnerships. I'm not talking about big financial partnerships. Local strategic partnerships. Work with your gatekeepers, with your community leaders, with your traditional leaders, the religious rulers, the man that is selling uh, local kose at the gates and so on. They are your key partners. If you don't bring them on board your projects, then you're dead on arrival. Okay. So we sat down with all the... We formed a group of NGOs. This is just to address the COVID-19 pandemic. And we formed a group of NGOs in Kebi of about three, 33 uh, civil societies. And they are now doing so well. It's like there's nothing else. The WHO, UNICEF, they're all commending them. I don't have much to do with them. We set it up, the stakeholder meetings and so on. And they're working. They are just local NGOs in all the 33 local government areas. Yes, we work with the chairman's wives, with the, with the councillors and so on, but these are political leaders, they're wives of chairmen. But the civil societies, you find they're, they're already trained, they know their local terrain, they are keyed and oriented in that development mindset in their localities. And so it was easy to get them on board the course. So they are now working right across the state doing COVID-19 awareness. So the lessons that I had learned from my previous advocacy programs, where sometimes you can easily meet resistance, is that you must work with the local partners. And we translated that to this COVID. So they're doing a lot of amazing work now, even for the schools going back to, uh, the students going back to school. They're working with schools, working with teachers. His Excellency, by the time he was going to approve the whole program, what he asked us to do was not just to do COVID-19, but to put a fraction of maternal and child health in it so that it won't be just um, targeting COVID because there are other pre-existing needs that we're going to come back and meet after COVID. Uh, we didn't include cancer. But there's an include there's a portion of uh, maternal and child health in the local governments that have the higher incidence of that. So they talk to them about things like attend antenatal attendance and so on. That's so great progress. That's yes, it's it's really a great program, and I'm so happy about it. And I don't really have much to do with it now. It's running on its own. Mm. So these are the kind of preventive measures that we can do. Good. Working at the cost working with the gatekeepers. That's great, Doctor. Um, we, we don't have much time left. I know we do have to let you go, but there is something I would like to touch on with you before we go. Um, great news, because the governor of Kebi State recently transmitted the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act and also the Child Rights Act to the State House of Assembly. And um, I believe that Kebi State might now become the first state in the Northwest to sign these acts into law. Um, how do you react to this? Um, well, we're very happy because it's something that, again, we've been pushing for anything that is going to help us to improve the rights of women to access their 
needs, but it needs health, it needs education, and children as well to be able to access better education is something that we're welcome. We always welcome to, and I'm very thankful again to the work that the advocates have done. His Excellency, of course, for always supporting everything that is going to bring progress in the state. And my sisters, the other governor's wives that have been working hard on this, not just in Kedi, but across the country. There's still a long way to go. Uh, the laws are one issue, but we're back to orienting the minds of our people and getting them to really understand that um, some of these uh, heinous crimes that are being committed are really wrong and should not be so. Uh, the laws, they don't really know uh, a lot about what law is in the book. All right, uh, doctor, that. let me leave you with this, uh, then we can let you go. Uh, you've done quite well. Now, WHO's goal is four cases per uh, cervical, uh, four cases uh, per 100,000. They want to reduce it to that, you know. Isn't that a very tall order? Is that feasible, really? Very briefly. If you have the tools, then it's achievable. We have the tools in our hand. We took smallpox, we took polio from hundreds of thousands to zero. Why can't we do four per hundred thousand? Why? Exactly. Why not? We, we when there's a will, there's a way, like they say. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Science. It's 2020. Yeah. Sure is. <laughs> I really. Thank you very much, Dr. Zainab Shinkafi Bagudu. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on Newsday with us today. Do have a great day, ma'am.